Welcome to News from Underground, your place for consistent anarchist news on the internet. Today, well, our special announcement is our new co-host friend, Arizona Flores, who just recently returned from Mexico City and Cancun. All right. <laughs> so well, how was that like? Uh, well, it was a lot warmer than here. Of course. I worked yeah. on my time a little bit. I hung out. Um, learned a bit what was happening culturally with my cousins and my family. I have a lot of family down there. Uh, and... There's still a lot of drug trafficking going on. That's what it looks like. Right? Uh, yeah, there's a lot of money to be made from that, uh, especially down in, uh, down the, uh, I guess, the borders of the U.S. You know, I guess the black market here, the, the illegality here, drives a lot of the communities out there to produce and create and try to enter it and pass it through here. Oh, yeah. And the worst part of it there is the monopoly on violence is really a monopoly of the government. The people aren't allowed to have guns. And right. No one's allowed to have guns, except mm -hmm. for police and, of course, lawbreakers. They're allowed to have guns, because who's going to stop them? Right, right, right. Uh, well, I guess that's... Uh, we're going well, to get a lot more into Mexico in a second, right? Yeah. So, the first article of the day is a criticism by Manuel Lopez Obrador. They can find El Chapo but they can't find 43 students. The leader of the leftist Mexican Morena Party, Andres Manuel Lopez Obrador, criticized the government for celebrating the recapture of the world's number one drug criminal, Joaquin El Chapo Guzman, when they cannot find 43 forcibly disappeared Ayotisanapa students. And who is El Chapo? So, oh, he's a very wanted drug lord. He's responsible, he was responsible for a long time for much of the drug trafficking through Mexico and to the United States. Is, is this the same guy that put the hit out on Trump? Yes. <laughs> the same guy. <laughs> I think like $10 million or something like that. Uh, I don't remember. Uh, I, I think there's, they're having a quip on Twitter going kind of back and forth. Uh, so after he escaped from jail and here Trump talking about making a wall and getting the Mexicans to pay for it, uh, a chapel respond is like, you know what, I'm going to put a hit on you and, and, and get you, uh, you know, so to speak. It was all about it was all about the trash talking. It was because we're not getting the good Mexicans. We're getting the bad Mexicans. We're getting right. the criminals and the you know and oh, the yeah. you know whatever. I, I think a lot of the uh, the good Americans that uh, South America ever got or Latin America or the CIA types, right? Mm -hmm. So you know we can kind of throw that back and forth uh, oh, for, for decades. And don't forget about giving drug. Uh, Obama giving the drug cartels lots of guns. Right, yeah, absolutely. So, because they need more guns. They need more guns. But you can't have any. Right. So what's the history of, uh, of this guy, of Chapo? Uh, are you familiar with a lot of this stuff? Do you hear a lot of your family or things like that down there talking about this? So he's in, he's in Sinaloa, which is um, on the west coast of Mexico, in the, in the middle. And they, but they operate pretty much everywhere in Mexico. Um, what they're talking about here is that they can't find 43 missing students. It is about a year about a year ago, there was a demonstration by 43 students that were inspired by a 1968 protest of students in Mexico City that were all massacred. And these students were also massacred, but it was done a lot more quietly. How, how were they massacred the first time? Who massacred them? I was actually the, the police authorities the in, Mexico, in Mexico City in the university. Mm -hmm. it, they, they, they started a protest, and it got really ugly really fast. What were they protesting? Um, they were protesting the conditions in Mexico, hmm. the poverty, and the rampant corruption. The corruption that has gotten worse and still exists in Mexico. It's actually the same thing that they were criticizing now. They were criticizing the complicitness that narcotics has a play in Mexican politics. Turns out, 43 students can be silenced quietly by just giving some money to the setas, and they can be disappeared. Right. You can find one guy, even though he's tried, he's escaped twice and tries to hide, but you can't find forty three missing students. Like, really? You ever seen the movie uh, Man on Fire? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Is that a good depiction of Mexico and uh, the zetas and people kidnapping and how the operation kind of works? Um. Some some of it's actually has some pretty good points. Yeah, everything's. Pretty much corrupt, and you can you can bribe anybody for anything. It's pretty much what everyone's tired of down there. It's the same thing in Bolivia. Everybody knows uh, the government doesn't exist to provide any kind of good except for what you kind of bribe your way, and because everyone there is corrupt, because they're not going to be in office uh, in the next following year. So in a small amount of time that you can actually get in there for those two or four years, 
you steal as much as you can and then get out before the next yeah. ruler comes in steal and takes your place. Steal as much as you can, help your friends out who you have now so they can help you out later All right. when you're out of office. Pretty, it's similar story in Mexico. Right. There's been no end of allegations to corruption uh, with, Pe with the pre current president, Peña Nieto. Uh, a lot, this was targeted, a lot of people thought that he had a hand in this in the disappearance of the students, but the official story from the government puts all the blame on the local authorities. Even though the local authorities in Guerrero, the state of Mexico where this happened, was put there by President Peña Nieto. What do you think about the, uh, I remember hearing a story in Mexico about these, uh, this village that like, disarmed all the local police extortionists and kicked them out and just, you know, well, we're going to arm ourselves and protect our own city. Did you hear about that? No. No? <laughs> I think this happened like a year or two ago and just everyone just got fed up with all the corruption in there and they just kicked out government from their own village. And then uh, they armed themselves and they've, they've been kind of going at it now for quite some time. I haven't really followed up what happened after that, but I just remember them just actually specifically targeting police extortionists and kicking them out and any would-be troublemaker and the whole, you know, mothers are armed, grandmothers are armed, everybody there is armed. Uh, and it's one village in Mexico. I mean, that sounds like it's the only place that would read that would have the the balls to do that would probably be somewhere in Tabasco. The Norteños or the northern Mexico is too full, too full of uh, cartels to do that. Right. Tabasco, though, there's not a, there's not a lot of trafficking there, and there's no in, there's no political interest. The only thing that's going to be there are parasitic, po parasitic politics. All right. <laughs> You guys want to know uh, how he got caught? <laughs> he got a little too uh, happenstance greedy with uh, seeing the stars, uh, movie stars, <laughs> and wanted to be one himself. And so um, while he was running away and he's tweeting and uh, he's thinking maybe, uh, you know, some people talk, so you, you, you know, eventually they might catch you, but let's do a movie deal. So this idea got stuck in his head, and he's thinking about, yeah, let me let me write my movie play, doing a biopic uh, biography, and and I'll be the star of my movie, or maybe trying to find someone to star me and, and act as me, you know, during my highlighting of adventures in, in Mexico. And one of the person that was uh, involved with that apparently uh, was Sean Penn, that people are kind of crediting, because uh, apparently he interviewed him very recently, and trying to say, oh, you like avocados? Oh, how's your mother? <laughs> And some weird was, uh, he did that for Rolling Stones, didn't he? Uh, I don't remember. Maybe yeah. Yeah, and, and he was he was basically accredited for uh, uh, accredited for bringing this guy, uh, of course not not purposely, but bringing this guy out of the uh, out of the woodwork. And I it, I just have to say it at this point. You, Sean Penn doesn't even piss me off anymore. I used to <laughs> I, that guy just used to really furl my goat, but he's just. <laughs> Now I just feel sorry for him, for his clear mental deficiency in his actions in life. He, he clearly does not know how to, how to make appropriate decisions. That's right, Jerry. He suffers from uh, liberal illness. Yeah. And uh, from that stems uh, his anti-gun position. Uh, he's so anti-gun uh, that he even sold off his own guns, you know, so that way no one can, uh, can use them anymore. Uh, but he, again, he's so anti-gun that he's going to start a movie called, I believe, the... The gunman. Uh, the gunman, right, in which he has to use a lot of guns because that is the only way he can save himself and his loved one from being harmed or, you know, incur bodily injury or death. Uh, so yeah, he calls people who are, who have personal firearms uh, and those particular weapons, cowardly killing machines. Only if you have it, you know, so his position is that only the government can have it because the government is a magical word with his with denotes unicorns and rainbows and everything good he can imagine and fantasize about uh, because the words are in there. It says government. Well, yeah, those are people you can trust. Yeah, they yeah, say we're from the government. I'd like to point out that this guy who, who, who loves to cast judgment on, you know, firearms owners and, and capitalists and, and, you know, successful businessmen, this is the same guy that tied up Madonna in a chair uh, and made her pee herself because he is freaking bonkers. I never heard of that. Wow. Yeah, yeah he was because he and, he and Madonna were dating for a while. I think they may have even been married for a short time. That's, that's probably not right. But, um, but yeah, uh, he, apparently one night like they were having a spat or something and, and he just 
flipped his top and tied her to a chair. And I don't know how long he kept her there, but so apparently it was long enough to for her to. So it wasn't consensual. It wasn't like the BDSM kind of. Thing. No, it wasn't no, nothing to do with no, no. He was no. <laughs> he was legitimately like tying her up against. He went yeah. cray cray. He had a psychotic breakdown. Yeah. Uh, which he sometimes looks like he can kind of pull in that kind of character when he does his movies, like in Mystic River, where he plays a thug, uh, kind of a mobster kind of guy, and kind of, yeah, he pulls in something that's already familiar to him. Cray crayness. Mm. Um, but speaking well, of... Speaking of crazy Hollywood people, <laughs> <laughs> uh, investigators say that a, that a Minnesota filmmaker obsessed with conspiracies killed family and himself. An Apple Valley, Minnesota filmmaker had become obsessed with a grim film project he was working on in the months leading up to the murder of his wife and his five-year-old daughter before killing himself, according to police, friends, and family members. Apple Valley police gave the Fox 9 investigators an exclusive look at the recently completed year-long investigation into the murder-suicide. So this is a story that um, a lot of and caps and uh, libertarians, uh, particularly conspiracy minded, will are probably very familiar with because um, this is this is about uh, David Crow Crowley, which was the I think he was the the main driver behind the film Gray State. Did you did you ever hear I've about heard that? Of that? Yeah. Yeah. So this this film is is about uh, it. You know. Uh, government intrusion on civil liberties and and about you know FEMA camps and the the whole FEMA camp theory and, and stuff like that and it's it's supposed to be kind of like a harbinger of what's to come um, as, as far as I can gather. So um, apparently, what uh, what the investigators found in this this guy's house was uh, well a, a little bit of backstory. He was found with his family, his his wife and daughter dead it was immediately considered a murder suicide and it was apparently a very bloody gruesome scene their their dog was still alive and eating their corpses and stuff it was you know super gross and there was an immediate um ex immediate suspicion that this was a a hit you know basically like a a government hit that they were trying to quiet this guy and as is the story they make it look like a murder suicide right uh and if you guys have not been watching uh making a murderer uh you'll see a lot of this shady stuff happens uh very frequently uh, especially out there in the middle of nowhere and should not put uh, any reasonable doubt in your minds in that uh this could never happen yes this this happens all the time this is the government um right. yeah th th this uh I've, I've heard about this guy making this during his development stage uh, during production, and then I remember hearing that he all of a sudden he just, you know, died, uh, yeah. um, killed himself, and just for for no reason. There's no not, no indication. There's no motive. There's no letter. There's um, just just a random event. Just one day he decided to uh, blow his brains out and out of his loved ones for no reason. Yeah. Well. Well. Apparently, the uh, what the police found on the scene were were things like. Um, uh, his his bloody fingerprints and his bloody his footsteps and of course the blood was his his wife's blood, um, and he wrote it, allegedly wrote like uh, Allah Akbar on the on the wall of his house what? in his wife's <laughs> blood what? and. Uh, <laughs> and well his his wife was a former Muslim turned Christian okay so the 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 explanation is that this was a sort of throwback to her past and apparently he he wrote like we all must surrender to allah on on the notepad on their computer or something and um i i'm not particularly conspiracy minded i do think a lot of this sounds pretty suspicious um, oh, this sounds very yeah. suspicious. <laughs> now that this sounds very rational, reasonable. Right. Well, well. Also, this and this is something that has been established. That was established by him and his friends and, and beforehand. So this guy, um, David Crowley, went. He was in the Iraq War, and he was actually stop lost to go to Afghanistan after he was he was supposed to be done with his tours and everything, and they stop lost him back to Afghanistan. So when they did, when this happened, he had already become very disenfranchised with the with the military industrial complex. He he had gotten 
he, he had realized that the wars were unjust, and here he is being sent off to Afghanistan. Um, and he, he has actually confided in his friends that, that he did have PTSD. So he did clearly have some... Yeah, but everybody has PTSD. You know, it's from uh, shitty childhoods. You know, that's not really anything unique or anything that kind of mark, demarcates you as something uh, as troubling some. Uh, you have shitty parents and all of that. Yeah, everyone has PTSD. And back then, you used to call it by a different term, right? Shell shock, different other terms to kind of denote uh, different kind of horrendous, horrifying experience. Um, so yeah, I don't, I don't buy the whole PTSD. Yeah, I mean, I'm sure it's a gruesome experience and not that great, but that's, that's what the military is, you know? Sorry that the recruiter lied to you and telling you that it was going to be this awesome, you know, see the world and have some fun, but no, it's just a murderous organization. Um, so, yeah. I don't, I don't think that's much of a, anything really to say that because he's suffering from PTSD, this would be a, a somewhat of a correlation to him to... Yeah, well, certainly it can't be, you know, it can't be directly causal. You know, right. or, or it can't be the only cause, rather, so or the only factor. Uh, obviously, there were other things at work, and 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 you know, there he was, according to his his family and friends, he was very much becoming isolated. Him and uh, he and his family mm -hmm. were becoming very isolated through this project, through the Gray State Project. So he's got to focus. Yeah, he's, he's got to you know, harness all that uh, talent and, and and that time for himself, and make sure this project is done and complete. Remove some of the distractions. Mm -hmm. I mean, isolating yourself from your friends and from your community isn't what makes you vulnerable in the first place. Right. Well, vulnerable maybe to be set up like something like this to happen, right? To even, kind of target out like that. Even vulnerable in a psychological standpoint. Like, I'm not. I'm not saying that he did this or that it was or that there's a conspiracy that they were all. It was a hit by. It was a hit by the government, but in any case. You don't want to necessarily separate yourself from your community and those who actually love you. And I will say, so they, his, his unfinished, uh, an unfinished cut of the, the Grey State film was actually released online. And I did watch it before they, you know, they actually came out after it was leaked saying, hey, don't watch this. You know, this isn't the, the, the completed project. He wouldn't have wanted you to, you know, and, and whatever. But um, before that had actually, they had released that, I'd, or before I saw it, I'd, I watched the film, and it was, to be honest, it, it didn't really have anything yeah. particularly explosive. So, hmm. and, and maybe, there's, maybe there's something to that. Maybe that, you know, the really, really big stuff was cut out. I, I don't know, but... Hmm. If, uh, it was largely actually fictional. A, a lot of it was really speculative on how how it's expected to how the future is expected to pan out according to them. Right, right, right. Uh, maybe that'll be an interesting movie now you can have here and watch. You know, how long is that? The rest of that, the Great State. I don't know. I, I think it's between an hour and two hours. Two hours. Yeah. Um, well, maybe we'll do a movie night. Do a count on that topic. Um, but yeah, that's. Uh, it's again. It kind of reminds me of uh, uh, making of a murder, which you need to start watching soon. <laughs> uh, what episode are you on now? I am. I'm about to watch the last episode. Oh wow! Yeah. So, <laughs> and, and I actually, I, I don't think I'm quite as gung ho about it as as probably most of the rest of us are. <laughs> I, I'm actually not convinced that that he was set up. Um, yeah. Yeah. It, for one, there was a lot of there was a lot of evidence that they just, that the filmmakers let down. All right, we'll, we'll hold this for couch. We'll take a hold of all their notes. We won't spoil anything. And then we'll save it for couch and just dissect the whole thing and see what we come to. Uh, next star we're going to come up is a, well, there's more information of the, the Senna Snack campaign out there in Oregon. The meet, meet the child abusing arsonist that inspired the Oregon militia standoff. A family of embattled ranchers who speak with the government inspired the armed takeover of a wildlife refuge in Oregon were once accused of repeatedly abusing a 16-year-old relative, including scraping his chest with sandpaper. Dusty Hammond, the child was punched to the ground, 
forced to hike 10 miles to a family ranch in order to eat chewing tobacco, according to a 2004 police report against Uncle Stephen Hammond and Grandfather Dwight Hammond Jr., who surrendered to federal authorities Monday on a 2012 arson conviction. So uh, there's some uh, really Jeez. graphic images that uh, came along with this. I looked over the police report as well, and uh, some of this you can find online and, and see for yourself. Uh, the sandpapering effect in which it just tore off pieces of his skin. Um, but for a reason, I'll get to that reason in a minute. So here's some of the four incidents that, you know, so we'll go over in, in, in a second. The first one is um, Stephen allegedly punched this kid hard enough to knock him to the ground and took his face and rubbed it into the gravel during an argument over how he was performing his chores. So, you know, when you hear a lot of talk about, well, we don't like how the government is uh, doing this, this, and to us, we don't like this arbitrary authority of the federal government treating us like slaves. So, well, it seems like to me that you kind of do. I mean, there has, there's no consistency there because that is the same way that you're acting towards other human beings around you in your vicinity, especially your family member like this kid, because he's not doing his chores. Yeah, this is the, this is the type of... It, you know, these are the type of people that, that claim that anarchy works because, or does not work because, you know, there are always psychopaths. Well, guess what? You're you creating are a psychopath. <laughs> you are. Uh, what do you think you're making in this world? Right. Another incident after uh, this, the kid, he was cited for being a minor in possession of alcohol. So already he's having problems. Already he's trying to find ways to deal with this. Already there are a lot of the, uh, the abuse, as not mentioned, these police reports, you know, that accumulate. Yeah, this addiction is going to be one of them. He allegedly punished the kid, Stephen, by driving him 10 miles from the family ranch and then making him walk home. So he abandoned this kid 10 miles away from his house. Yeah, forced march. Come back home. Why back to you, your slave camp. I would have run away at that point. Like, oh, you, yeah. You've driven me away from here? Yeah, okay. That's a good time to defoo. Well, you've left me out here. Okay. All right. So, 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 I always yeah. prefer that word. Um, what does defoo stand for? Uh... FOO is family of origin, so right. DFU is basically decoupling from your decoupling. family of origin. Uh, but I, when you kind of beat down a kid so much, uh, I think you kind of ruin any kind of chance of him thinking that he can fight ever fight back. Uh, yeah. You know, he's well, already in great to be treated like a slave, and you don't have to do much violence to kind of control him. Yeah, that's every been, once in a while. That's been proven through uh, through. Um, it's it's called um, learned helplessness. Yeah, and that's what happens with el with circus elephants and and cir well circus animals in general, and with dogs sometimes. Right. If you if you treat a dog badly enough. Yeah, our vo our voters have they learned learned helplessness? Many yeah, that's what it is. <laughs> we we'll come back every year. <laughs> that is uh, the third incident. So after this, um, the child was cited as a minor in possession of tobacco. Then. And so Stephen allegedly made him eat two cans of skull smokeless tobacco and then again walked him from the Diamond, Oregon to the Hammond Ranch. A lot of walking. Uh, eating two cans of smokeless tobacco. Oof. And apparently it was just saying that it was just to teach him a lesson, teach him that tobacco is not good for you. Yes. And, uh, they, you know, and make him learn this way by just eating uh, it raw. Yeah, that's, a, that's an old... Uh, "Quote unquote remedy for that type of behavior. Like if if a, if a child smokes a cigarette, tries a cigarette, you make them smoke an entire pack to teach them how disgusting. While you're going around smoking yourself, right? Yeah, uh, and drugs are bad. And while you have you know your kitchen stocked with beer, then you have your bookshelves instead of books. You have beer bottles. Yeah. Well, God forbid you. God forbid you actually talk to your child. Oh yeah. <laughs> The fourth incident is particularly striking, however. The kid, who reportedly was diagnosed with depression at this time, used a paper clip, clip to carve the letter J into one side of his chest and the letter S onto the other side. So in response, Stephen allegedly told him that he was not going to let him deface the family by carving on himself. He said that Stephen then used sandpaper to remove the carved letters from his chest, sanding each side for at least five minutes. He then told the kid that he would fillet the initials off his chest if the sandpaper did not work. So here are you're talking about people who advocate for respect for private property. Hey, they're taking over this land. We've been this generation for, for quite a long, long time. Oh, you've been generations of monsters, it seems to be like, uh, and having no uh, respect for self-ownership, right? So this, so this is a laughing stock. We want to come over and try to get everybody to come out there and 
parade and campaign for you and send you snacks for, for, for monsters, for people out there. So trying to say that, uh, yes, you know, we're here for liberty. We're here for, for, for freedom. No, you, you know, you treat your own relatives like freaking slaves. You treat them like you would the federal government treats you. Uh, and they're, they're treating their child worse than a slave. Yeah. This is, this is despicable. Right. Mm -hmm. And, and when a lot of people talk about the thing that's going on in Oregon and say, well, you know, this is this could be the start of something. No, this is, is this a repeat of something. There's no start of something. What would they have learned while they're over there? If, if it ever, it's never going to be successful. But if they, if say, for example, it worked, what would they have learned? The same thing all over again, beating each other up, treating uh, children like animals, like slaves. Nothing will they have learned. Still advocate for slave masters. That's what they already do. They still want the Constitution. They still want to be slaves. You know, nothing good could ever come out of this. The only thing uh, that you'll find is just repeating the matrix all over and over and over. You know, that's been the history of humanity. Think of it, well, maybe we write this piece of paper, correct, right, put another word in there. Maybe it could work finally this time. But it doesn't change the morality of, of their morality. It doesn't change. Yeah. So here's, here's some, some information that a lot of people, I guess, are, are not uh, privy to, you know, in terms of these folks that are are out there uh you know these these people are not innocent these these guys are child abusers you know in, in terms of what they're doing to their another human being there's no respect for for anyone's dignity here for for humanity it's just a repeat of the same thing you know they're acting the first the first government that many children face themselves are their own parents right if anyone is interested in actually liberating tyranny it'll be this child from this tyranny that he faces growing up you know the, the thing is so it... Well, when you when you showed me this earlier, so I, I was actually going to approach this just as a you know what what the what the um, I, I'm sorry who are, who are the guys doing the uh, doing the actual standoff? Uh, I think the bunnies, some the of the bunny kids are out there. Yeah. So the uh, what I was gonna, my claim was going to be sort of an argument that the bunnies are standing on the principle. They are not you know they don't know about this. So at least you can I would assume they don't know about this. And they're standing on the principle of this, you know, you have to protect a man's livelihood. You can't, you know, go after that. That's bullshit. I can't even say that anymore. Right. Because if you, if you take this, if you cannot respect your own son's claim for bodily integrity, and even past the point of stuff like circumcision, where you are actually sandpapering his skin off. No, you've lost any claim to your own livelihood or your own your property rights or whatever. Yeah. None of this stuff is justified. There's no excuses there. Uh, and this is kind of what happens when a lot of people make this uh, very, you know, quick to, well, something's happening over there and, and, and quick on the bandwagon effect without actually knowing any of these people, right? Actually knowing they have any principles, actually know if they're, if they're virtuous or not. Uh, just because, uh, you know, they have a quip with the government. A lot of people have quips with the government. You know, let's just stand by at least with people of virtue, if you want to make, make a real effect and change something that's last, everlasting, not towards something that, uh, that just continues to repeat and enables this kind of monstrous uh, activities, this monstrous uh, habits, these relationships. Mm -hmm. What's going to happen to this kid, he's probably going to end up doing the same thing to his kids if he ever has them himself. Uh, if you guys ever are interested in actually helping anybody involved, it should be this kid himself. I think he's 19 now. <laughs> I don't think... Uh, I don't know if he's still hanging around there, but I think that's really who the innocent person involved in all of this should be kind of paid attention more towards, not to these uh, these monsters that uh, put themselves in that mess to begin with. So, with that, uh, this is Cal Malone. Gerson Flores. And Phil Pollard. See you guys at the Virtue Party. Take good care. Rest in peace, Davy Jones. <laughs>